I have been asked to be the spokesman for this Allied Expeditionary Force in saying a word of introduction to what you are about to see. It is a story of the Nazi defeat on the Western Front. So far as possible, the editors have made it an account of the really important men in this campaign. Of course, to tell the whole story would take years, but the theme would be the same. Teamwork wins wars. Que todos los niños del mundo no conozcan los sufrimientos y las tristezas que tienen los niños que están aún en poder de los enemigos de mi patria. Viva España. Thinking of a world in the light of the sun and all the many lives that were ever begun. Tonight we march against Poland, and tomorrow we'll see the dawn of a new order. We shall make a German empire of the world. Tonight you will take the first step along a dark road from which there is no turning back. You will have to go on and on, from one madness to another, leaving behind you a wilderness of misery and hatred, until at last you are lost and destroyed. Everything that happened on the 6th of June 1944 was a very dramatic gamble that the future of Europe was going to depend on. So how was it that the Germans accepted completely the story that the attack on the Normandy beaches was actually a diversionary feint? Why was it that even two weeks after the Allies had learned it in Normandy, there were actually more German troops in the Pas de Calais area than there had been prior to the invasion. This was quite extraordinary. Why was there never any major counterattack as the troops landed in Normandy? Why was the 1st SS Panzer Division turned back in its tracts as it started to move down to Normandy 
from the Belgian frontier to attack the Allies? The answer is deception, strategic deception. One of the tragedies of the Second World War was an attack made on a defenseless aircraft, a BOAC DC-3, that was flying on a regular route between England and Lisbon. One of the passengers on board, they all perished, was the famous actor Leslie Howard. This was an opportunity for the spy codenamed Arabelle to complain bitterly to his German controllers in Madrid about the danger that this had placed his own personnel in. The Germans were very embarrassed by this particular episode and orders were given after that that none of those civilian aircraft should be attacked again. The other day I was offered money to get information. What sort of information? Secret information. You're a very lucky man, Mr. Beaumont. That sort of information is always easy to give. If it is secret enough, you alone know it. All you need is a little imagination. Arabelle was a key figure. He was transmitting to the Germans in 1944, sometimes for up to three hours a night from London. He had sub-sources, he had information from Glasgow, from Liverpool, from the east of England. He had 22 sub-agents who were reporting to him. When the Germans needed information, it was possible to send one of his agents, perhaps a, a Greek seaman or a Venezuelan student. These were all characters that were under the control of Arabelle, and he was able to deploy these agents and then supply their eyewitness reports back to his controller. We dürfen die Panzer nur mit ausdrücklicher Genehmigung des Führerhauptquartiers einsetzen. Aber die werden es doch nicht wagen, mir eine abschlägige Antwort zu geben. Machen Sie dem Führerhauptquartier Meldung und bestehen Sie darauf. Hören Sie Blumentritt. Bestehen Sie darauf, dass die Panzer sofort zu meiner Verfügung gestellt werden. So who was Arabel? As you know, Alaric was a Goth trained in Rome, who defeated the Romans later on. the outbreak of the Second World War, he had gone to the British Embassy in Madrid in order to volunteer his services. He wanted to assist the British in any way that he could. Who was this man? Was he genuine? In these days, he would have been called a, a walk-in, somebody who appears out of nowhere, is not recruited, but just merely turns up and offers their services. But the big question was, well, what is this person and why is he doing it? The British had said, you're a non-competent, you are a neutral, you should stay out of the war, the war is our affair. Is he an agent sent to dump false information upon you? Is he somebody who has been sent to cause a diplomatic incident? Undaunted by that, he'd gone straight round to the German embassy and said that he was a great admirer of Mr. Hitler and he would very much like to help the Nazis and he'd be willing to spy. Have your position for a good waiter. There's nothing today. You must just 
looking for a job. And a possibility was to become a spy. The Nazis were enthusiastic to accept his offer to spy, to train him in secret writing techniques, and to dispatch him to Britain. People have all sorts of wild ideas of what a spy is. But the most important thing for an intelligence agent is to not to appear different from anybody else. You must have first an extremely good cover. You must live up to the normal life of the person who has that cover. I mean, if somebody is working in a store, he must keep the hours of the store he's working for. He must do that kind of a life and he must talk about the work he does in the store and not refer to anything else. The uh, naval maneuvers have not been called off. Oh no, just a change of orders. Oh, it must be very interesting to receive important information like that before anyone else. <laughs> Admiral's wives are always the last to hear of anything of real importance. I admire your discretion. In the case of Arabelle, it turned out that although he was known to his Abwehr controllers by that code name in England, he was codenamed Garbo. He had been run by the British Security Service and he'd been given the code name Garbo because his case officer believed him to be the best actor in the world. No, no, no. Our, our poor friend Dubois says that you are a spy. Well, of course I am. The master of deception, the greatest double agent of the Second World War, nobody knew who he was. The need-to-know system was applied rigorously for the security of the organization and for all the other double agents, and in particular, Garbo himself. We never knew his true identity. At 1980, I interviewed a Russian spy, Professor Sir Anthony Blunt, who had been exposed in November 1979 as a traitor. And he broke the need to know rule. During his lunch hour, he would go down into his colleagues' offices, he would look through their papers, he would look at anything that was left on their desks. So here was somebody who was acquiring information. And I asked him, do you remember the Garbo case? And he said, of course. He said, actually, I met Garbo once, and I said, do you remember his name? What was his real name? And Anthony Blunt said, I think his name was Juan or Jose Garcia. I was fascinated to learn that, but it didn't really help me because practically every Spaniard that I had ever met was called Juan or Jose Garcia. But nevertheless, I felt that I had made some progress. A couple of years later, I interviewed another intelligence officer and I played a slight trick on him he, I felt, knew the true name of Garbo, and I said, you don't have to worry about security. I, I know his real name. Wasn't it Juan or Jose Garcia? And he corrected me. He said, Juan Pujol Garcia. I said, oh, yes, that's right. violent years. There were gunners, there was chaos, but his father believed in order and harmony, as well as his mother. And this played a role in his conviction that he must strive towards a better world. It's difficult to imagine all this, the chaos and, and the violence, but it's even more difficult to imagine how the world was when there was no radio, no television, no computers. He came from a bourgeois, moderately wealthy family, enjoyed a 
a good education and was a moderately successful businessman. Uh, it seemed like a fairly ordinary person leading a fairly ordinary life, but the events in Spain that surrounded him were far more controversial. fotografies en dels anys 30 és un home amb una certa prestància, amb sombrero, una mica una mica dandy en determinats aspectes, bueno, un, un fill de, de la burgesia de Barcelona, acomodada, que li permetia viure sense massa massa problemes i a més a més, vull dir, allò amb una certa imaginació i amb una certa eh, glamour, lo que li permetia ser una mica eh, eh, per dir alguna manera, una imatge de conquistador i de triomfador en aquella Barcelona complicada que van ser els anys previs a l'esclatament de la Guerra Civil. de la Guerra Civil va ser eh, per Joan Pujol a l'acabar una mica amb la seva vida de dandy burgès català. En aquells anys se li va ensorrar el món. was called under arms by the Republicans. But he didn't go, didn't want to. He went into hiding, which means that he was considered to be a deserter with the risk of being shot. Joan Pujol no era un home tampoc de caràcter coratjós en aquest aspecte i va decidir passar a la clandestinitat, va decidir amagar-se fins que no passés a aquella època, el que ells consideraven, que no tenien idea de que la guerra es prolongaria tres anys i es pensaven que seria un període curt. I s'hi va passar molts mesos tancat. Es va primar molt, es va deprimir molt, perquè, clar, la seva nòvia anava a veure de temps en temps i portar-li menjar, però que és un neguitós i bellugadís, com ell ella era tancat a cop i volta, doncs eh, se li va fer insuportable. A 
after that year, he decided to join the Republican army. His plan, however, was to go to the front line so that he could cross the front line and join the nationalists. It's curious because his theatral la va continuar utilitzant, el primer que va, evidentment, amb ell, era una persona absolutament la violència li feia basarda, això de tirar tiros, no passava pel seu pensament, i va dir que, li van dir, bueno, perquè vostè què sap fer? I va dir que tenia coneixements de radiotelegrafista, de morse i de comunicació. I, evidentment, era fals, no en tenia ni idea, se'n van donar compte de seguida i el van enviar a passar cables... I ell explicava que havia agafat dues bombes de mà, se les havia posat a la butxaca i havia començat a caminar amb un grup que estava fent una inspecció de front. En un moment determinat es va desenganxar del grup, es va amagar i va esperar que la cosa passés, esperant que es fes de nit i poder passar les línies i passar-se al bando franquista. Ho va fer tan malament que el que va fer és, quan va arribar la nit, és començar a caminar en una direcció i es va tibucar de bando. Va tornar enrere, va tornar a les seves pròpies línies, a les línies de l'exèrcit republicà, pensant-se que era el franquista. Llavors, allà, ell explicava que quan li van donar l'alto, va dir, no tiré, soy un republicano, que me paso los nacionales. Evidentment, el que va passar és que va començar a rebre tretxes a tot arreu, van començar a disparar, i la feina que va tenir es va amagar a sota d'uns arbres, d'un matorral, i ho va passar fatal, perquè, esclar, van pendir a aquella zona disparant, i després patrulles, i no van trobar per casualitat. Ell va passar la nit amagat allà, fins que, finalment, al cap d'unes hores, quan es va calmar el tema, es va treure les botes per no fer soroll, suposo, amb un acolloniment bestial, ho explicava, i va arribar a les línies franquistes, per això deia, va ser l'animada, ho va passar fatal aquell mes, però mai, si ara ho hagués de tornar a fer, no ho faria, perquè m'han fet passar la padrina. May I ask, Excellency, what is my objective in this mission? The objective is to deal a death blow to the Allies. Madrid was probably, I think undoubtedly, the most exciting place for espionage in World War II. Lisbon was also very exciting. But of course, many more agents and people were trying to avoid the Germans were in Madrid because they had to get through Spain in order to get to Lisbon or to get to Malaga, to get someplace where they could get a boat or some kind of transportation to escape. There is a new password. Yes, Herr Baron. Immer vorwärts. Immer vorwärts. Always forward. The answer? Niemals zurück. Niemals zurück. Never backward. Els havia dit als alemans que podia anar a Anglaterra, però no era veritat. I es va establir a Lisboa, també sense conèixer la ciutat en absolut, una mica l'aventura. 
In fact, he settled with his wife and their child in the little fishing port of Cascais, a bit further beyond Estoril from Lisbon. But of course, nowhere close to England. Juan had never been to England. Llavors va començar a voltar per allà, inventant sabíem que els hi podia enviar en els alemans que els hi fes una mica de gràcia. It was largely carried out in a library. This was the basis of his secret information by just going to open source records, gazetteers, almanacs. His first notional recruit was a, a KLM pilot of the Dutch National Airlines that was still operating from the United Kingdom and flying to Lisbon. He was able to inform the Germans that this pilot was being able to deliver his mail without it passing through any of the censorship process. The messages that the pilot was pensava que eren cartes de mort destinades a un amant que tenia que que deia que tenia a Lisboa. The messages are deciphered ciphered again in another code and sent to Berlin. Champagne! From occupied France, Mao from Denmark, and lobster from Norway. Every country we conquer feeds us. And these are just a few of the good things we'll have when this war is over. Caviar! From Russia. Very difficult to get. Agent J-5 was a secretary at the Ministry of War. She became Alaric's lover. The Abwehr provided him with money to allow him to spoil this lady with presents and flowers and so on, because she could provide him with high rank information. But they want me to recruit agents. How does one recruit an agent, Hasselbacker? You invent them too, Mr. Bogart. He spoke no English. He never visited Great Britain. And therefore, some of his uh, terminology is somewhat odd. He said that he had been visiting the docks uh, in a port and that in talking to the dock workers, they had become very voluble and had supplied information just for the price of a litre of wine. Can you have any drink with me, please? No. I don't drink with no strangers, see? Well, the idea of an English dock worker ever eat, drinking wine in his entire life was quite extraordinary. I think you gentlemen are not liking you. Don't pay any preliminary attention to that polite to Mr. Karoki. He always gets like that when he's had a couple of beers. He said that uh, London was so hot in the summer that all the neutral embassies all the diplomatic missions had moved down to the coast, to Brighton, and that he would have to visit Brighton in order to get information from neutral diplomats. Well, this is complete nonsense. I mean, even, <laughs> even at the best of times, uh, London is hardly unbearably hot. He said a lie, then he invented another one bigger, and, of course, he had an effect that, every time, he would have more. Thank you very much. There is no catching money. Oh, better hiding it, please. And speak English, I understand him. Arabel, Arabel, la red que encapçalava a l'Eric, o sigui, el Joan Pujol, el gran titiritero de tota aquesta xarxa. We have but one objective, to win the war, even if we have to fight the entire world. No nation. No group of nations can stop our advance, the advance of German culture. Someday, someday, Germany will own the world. Historian? 
A psychiatrist could explain it better. The German sees himself as the innocent victim of world envy and hatred conspired against, set upon by inferior peoples, inferior nations. He cannot admit to error, much less to wrongdoing. Not the German. And not the German ideology, but the Nazi ideology. There is a difference between the two, of course. Uh, the Nazi ideology was based on myths, on the superiority of the Aryan race and the prototype of the fair hair, blue eyes, uh, pink complexion and so on. And also the mythology about the Jews. All that were myths and legends. Now people who believe this or try to make people believe this uh, are more prone to accept that someone will swallow this and that I will come and uh, convince them that they are convinced supporters of that ideology. How many people will we feed today? How he started to run out of information because he'd never been to England and he's, of course he didn't have any sources in England. So once again he went to the British Embassy in Lisbon and offered his services, explained that he was a fully-fledged German spy, that he was in contact with the Abwehr and he was willing to act on behalf of the Allies. Well, they threw him out again. They didn't believe it. Yeah. Malta? Jawohl, Herr General Oberst. Malta als Basis. Und dann Südgriechenland. Das ist möglich. Geben Sie mir Generalfeldmarschall Keitel. The linchpin, the key event, that persuaded the security service that there was a major leakage of information, but a rather mysterious one, was one particular report that had come from William Gerber's agent number two, who was supposedly living in Liverpool. He supplied information about a very large and very important convoy that was being dispatched from Liverpool in order to relieve the siege of Malta. The Germans took elaborate countermeasures and sent a large number of Luftwaffe aircraft operating from the south of France and from Sardinia to intercept this non-existent convoy. But the whole Malta convoy episode proved that if this particular source, who was evidently a fabricator, could divert so many enemy resources that such store was set by the enemy on his information that properly directed, he would become a very important and significant strategic instrument. Iban los americans a hacer un matiz que vio fetema dice, eh, pues que aquí y tal y cual vengo a oferir más, pero ahora él decía, bueno, ya tenía algo para oferir. Y era la información que me habían pasado los alemanes. Al contacto había tenido hasta Madrid, la tinta simpática, los códices, yo ya tengo algo. And said, I'm a huge admirer of the United States, but I am a German spy and I would like to assist the Americans in any way I can. And he was interviewed by an assistant naval attaché named Edward Rousseau. And Rousseau had sent a message to London saying, what am I to do with this Spaniard who is a German spy and says that he's fabricating information and sending it back to his controllers? I que tal i qual els anglesos van dir, bueno, ja el tenim. Aquest és el que està enviant els missatges pel seu compte. Un espia freelancer pel seu compte. Evidentment, es van entrevistar amb ell. I van dir, escolta, mira cap aquí, que et... Vull dir, ens interessa, ens interessa, tu estàs disposat a continuar a seguir aquest joc? Sí, t'enviem a Anglaterra. He was taken to Gibraltar and from there flew to the UK. intelligence agent, uh, code names form a very important part of her work. We, for example, are given code names in our intelligence agency when we're being trained. My code name was changed very quickly when I got to Madrid 
And in fact, in my books, my publishers changed my code names because they didn't like it. They didn't think it was attractive enough, so they gave me a new one. Which they gave me Tiger when my code name originally was Butch, which they didn't think sounded very glamorous for a woman spy. But actually, we use those code names very seriously, and we try never to use them in normal life. It's one of the sort of laws of intelligence work. El primer nom que va tenir va ser Bobril. Ah, uh, vull dir, altres coses i vaig dir, bueno, que quan el veu batejar, bueno, el primer que li vam posar va ser perquè en el trajecte de, 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 del camp d'aviació on va a aterrar al sud d'Anglaterra fins a Londres, van passar per una carretera, avui, on, on una carretera, avui hi havia anuncis del caldo, concertat de caldo Bobril, van dir, bueno, li direm Bobril. No, però després, quan, quan el van començar a parlar amb ell, a interrogar-lo a fons i va veure la capacitat inventiva que tenia el Cyril Mills, que era el cap de, de, de tot aquest departament, va dir, pues, el, el, el batejem com Garbo, i Garbo es va quedar, i Garbo ha passat tota la seva vida. I'm Nigel West, I'm a lecturer at the Center for Counterintelligence and Security Studies in Washington, D.C. I've spent 25 years in the intelligence community studying and writing the histories of mainly British intelligence organizations. I am the Countess of Romanones. I came to Spain in 1944 as Aline Griffith, working for the American Intelligence Service, which was then called OSS. Em dic Xavier Binader, soc periodista, i bona part de la meva trajectòria professional ha estat dedicat al periodisme d'investigació. My name is Mark Seaman. I'm a historian of British intelligence in the Second World War. I'm Stan Franks, I'm a psychiatrist, and the story of Jean Pujol found me recently, and uh, it is extraordinary. Why was he the best actor? Because the 22 sub-agents that he was receiving reports from, all these very remarkable characters never existed except in his imagination. Once in London, Pujol, now known as Garbo, is given a series of intensive debriefings, both by MI5 and SIS officers. And this is all a process of still testing, still trying to make sure he says who he is, still trying to get the measure of the man. Was he a man who wanted money? to test out his ideology as well. What's the most efficacious way of handling him? Well, one of the major changes is that it is decided that uh, his first case officer, a man called Cyril Mills, will be replaced by another MI5 officer, Thomas Harris. Tommy Harris was a very remarkable man. He was a brilliant artist in his own right. Who spoke Spanish fluently and actually becomes the other half of the double act. The network of agents that Harris and Garbo created was a truly motley collection. The Germans are very keen on details of convoys, so they make sure that they recruit merchant sailors. They want details of what's going on in India so they recruit an agent who is about to go to India. Another one went to Canada, so it became almost a global organization. By delivering the goods, by giving the Germans what they need, the Germans don't go elsewhere. Well, let me know when there are further reports. It's an incremental process. The more you give them, the happier they are, the more they trust Garbo, uh, and this uh, immutable path uh, uh, begins to stretch out in front of it, where Garbo becomes the German star player, at the same time he's, uh, he's really the British star player. No one was going to give the Germans true real-time information, so the trick there was to get Garbo to send true real information to his German controllers, but to delay it. But how did it happen? How the hell do I know how it happened? The aim was to feed false information to the Germans as well. 
But this had to be very, very carefully considered. It had to be consistent. Uh, it had to be, in some cases, verifiable. Now, the, one of the ways in which Garbo managed to verify his reports was to have two of his fictitious agents reporting it from two separate sources. Yes? Very serious report, sir. Two hours ago, an American Major General commanding their 66th Armored Division arrived at Corps Headquarters. Advanced elements are already setting up a command post. Where did you get this? A resident of the district, sir. Is he trustworthy? I don't trust any of these line crossers, sir. But this one's been right before. One of the agents reported that an attack was imminent at any moment. Garbo offered his opinion that he slightly doubted this. The Germans, in turn, being intelligence officers themselves, offered the belief that perhaps Garbo's agents were being fed false information. You reach a point after a certain point where you move so far away from the truth that uh, two lies become a truth, uh, a half-truth, and a half-truth equals a full truth. And this is all just parcel of this extraordinary web of bogus stories, true stories, half-true stories, uh, and even it sometimes confounds the historian uh, to try and pick your way through the fictions and the truths. They had little file index cards on every single agent. They recorded every single message that each had sent. Uh, there was a, a waiter who worked for the Americans. There, there was, were uh, communists. Uh, British there were uh, Air Force fascists. Uh, NCO. There Welsh was nationalists. Venezuelan student. There, there was a Venal Greek in seaman. Individuals All of these people had different personalities, different cash. problems. That must have been fun because they were influencing each other. And I can imagine that at moments it was hilarious when they imagined a person and what effect it would have on the German if they believed these things. And that was a major point. There was more humor on the side of the British than on the side of the German. Know your enemy. I am told that the English have a secret weapon. Their sense of humor, and I am determined to find out all about it. For instance, P.G. Wodehouse. Listen. The man with the beard sighed. Down in the forest, something stirred. Is that funny? No, it's not funny. Herr uh, Lewis Carroll. Alice through the looking glass. Twas Breidig and the slithy Tovies did gar and gimbal in the Vaabe. Painful rubbish. Very painful. Oh, I have come to the conclusion that the English sense of humor is a myth. They have no sense of humor, and therefore they have no secret weapon. The whole thing is a complete bluff. Yes, yes. Ah, but wait. When I am Gauleiter of London, I shall see to it that there is no talk of sense of humor. Oh, you will, Herr Reich Minister. November 1942, the Allies planned an invasion of North Africa. And Goebbels, the notional agent in Liverpool, should have been able to report substantially on the build-up of shipping for the invasion. So poor old William Goebbels had to die. He started to fall ill. William Goebbels then was going to go into hospital for an operation for cancer, and he died. Germans were very upset about this because William Goebbels had supplied valuable information and they passed their condolences to Mrs. Goebbels and Mrs. Goebbels received a pension and because she was unemployed, she became one of the cipher clerks for Garbo himself. He would take hours to have to prepare his messages and send his messages to the Germans and of course she never existed uh, she was as real as her completely bogus husband. But all of this information was supplied to the Germans, and together 
they proved a very remarkable combination. His case officer would read the traffic and then he would relay this information to Berlin. So that particular relay was very important for the British to intercept because it had been encrypted in the Enigma cipher for that particular day. It meant that the Allied cryptographers, having a very long original message written by Garbo, had been reciphered on the Enigma circuit. And although under normal circumstances, a cipher machine like that would be absolutely unbreakable, if you already know the clear text, then you can very simply reverse engineer and work out the key settings for that particular day. So by intercepting and decrypting Garbo's traffic, it was possible not only to read his message, which was of no great value since the clear text had been written in London anyway, but it provided an insight into every other Abwehr encrypted message sent that day right the way across the whole of Europe. In addition to the data that is exchanged between the Germans and Garbo, there is a, a very human side, uh, but one that actually helps, one feels that the, the bond between the German controllers and Garbo therefore becomes all the stronger. And therefore issues such as trust and faith and belief become all the more significant. It was impossible to disbelieve Garbo because of the passion and the sincerity and the, the very long-winded nature of his communication. Garbo had a particularly sort of wordy style of writing in spite of the fact that the Germans were asking him to keep it brief and to the point. Uh, he was somewhat verbose. His style was impossible to mimic. It was passionate, it was flowery language. This was a real person, he wasn't just a cipher. That he must have been extremely intelligent and sensitive. I think also it's important for an agent to be super sensitive to what people feel when they hear, or what they think when they receive his messages or when they see him and talk to him personally. Uh, a double agent has a, is a role that I would recommend to very few people to follow, and I think there are very few people who would be able to do, do it. Underlying every double agent operation is the need to ensure that your opponent has a ready supply of cash to keep the operation going. In Garbo's case, uh, being in England, it was very difficult for the Germans to supply him with the money he needed, and of course, with 22 sub-agents, he was a very expensive operation. MI5 devised a very ingenious scheme to be able to supply Garbo with the more than 20,000 pounds that ultimately were paid by the Germans to Garbo and his network. The scheme involved a fruit merchant in Madrid that also happened to have a branch in London. This was codenamed Plan Dream, and it was a method of being able to provide Garbo with the funds that were needed, ultimately not just to run his completely notional network, but in fact, at the end of the war, to very largely finance much of the British intelligence operations. So, ironically, one comes to the conclusion at the end of the Second World War, it was German intelligence that had provided the funds that had paid for British intelligence operations.
Evasión. After personal consultation on the 8th of June in London with my agents Johnny, Dick and Doric, whose reports were sent today, I'm of the opinion, in view of the strong troop concentrations in southeast and eastern England, which are not taking part in the present operations, that these operations are a diversionary maneuver designed to draw off enemy reserves in order then to make a decisive attack in another place. In view of the continuous air attacks on the concentration area mentioned, which is a strategically favorable position for this, it might very probably take place in the Pas de Calais area. Since the 1st of June, we knew that the landing had to come sometime very soon. We knew that because um, of the multitude of messages that had come and gone. I, being in the code room, knew a lot because, of course, the messages all came through the code room, and I, I deciphered them and enciphered the new ones. So I remember that it was very exciting. And then when it became aware in daylight, we have all celebrated. Somebody brought in a bottle of champagne in those days. Champagne was sort of a big celebration, and we were celebrating. However, we were not able to uh, do much in the daytime. It was only just our own little group that were so happy about this, because in Madrid, life went on just as every other day, and nothing special very happened. Nothing was in the newspaper yet. There was, of course, in those days, no television. Um, I suppose the radios must have had some report of it, but we were there waiting at night. We had been waiting several nights before also. It was certainly a very big event for all of us. The decision to go to Normandy instead of the Pas de Calais was a tremendous gamble. If the Germans had counterattacked in the first three days, it's very likely that there would have been a major catastrophe. And I'm, I'm not a what-if uh, historian, but, but if you imagine for a moment that the 6th of June 1944 had been a disaster and not a success, think what the consequences might have been. Certainly there couldn't have been a second invasion in 1944, so the war would have dragged on for another year. That meant that the Germans would have been able to redeploy troops from France and send them to the Eastern Front to deal with the Soviets. So the war may have taken a very different course. The V1 weapons would have flattened London, and what about the V2 weapons? Although militarily they were of no significance, they were ballistic missiles, very hard to aim, very inaccurate. But supposing they didn't have a one-ton warhead of high explosive, supposing with an extra year or two years on the war, the Germans had been able to develop an atomic weapon. We're all set to go. The deception plan to delude the Germans to the time place and the size, the magnitude of the invasion, was almost as complex as the actual invasion plan itself. This was codenamed Operation Fortitude. Fortitude North was to suggest that the invasion would not take place in France, but actually would be across the North Sea to attack Norway. Fortitude South was the deception plan to delude the Germans that the attack was going to come in the Pas de Calais. The Germans made the Pas de Calais the most heavily fortified part of the Atlantic War. And therefore, Garbo's job was to uh, reassure them that their assumptions were correct. We're going to let it leak out that you are here under cover, that you're preparing to invade at the Pas de Calais. We hope to pin down the German 15th Army there so they can't be used against us at Normandy. Is that all you people think I'm good for? We're going to build an army of 12 divisions around you. All fictitious, of course. Dummy troop concentrations, dummy landing craft, simulated radio traffic. You see, the Germans are convinced that you are going to lead the main invasion effort. 
Their agents will spot you here before long, then we can move you to your new headquarters at Nutsford. What do I do there? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. General Patton was indeed publicly announced as the commander of the 1st United States Army Group, but actually he only ever employed 14 soldiers. The way this deception was played upon the Germans was to create all of the sort of wireless traffic that you would expect uh, an army group to be generating. All the aircraft were actually made of plywood and balsa wood and cardboard. An entirely notional collection of divisions. The tank tracks that were seen across fields indicating that tanks had been hidden under trees had been prepared by special tractors. Dummy landing craft. They could scarcely remain afloat, but they were there for sufficient time to be photographed by the Luftwaffe. You wanted the Germans to come to their own conclusions rather than have it uh, sort of spoon-fed to them. Huge amounts of stores were dropped in the Pas de Calais area to supply notional resistance groups. Now, this might be perceived as being a, a dreadful waste of weapons and explosives, but it also led the Germans to think that supplies to the resistance were really being stepped up. German transportation uh, communications were systematically bombed. Now, there was no point doing that just in the area behind the real landing beaches of Normandy, but it actually had to happen not merely across the whole of northern France, but also with even greater intensity than Normandy in the part of Calais. And all the information was like a jigsaw puzzle. Garbo himself was part of a huge false picture. But when they fitted together, indicated that there was a very large army headed by General Patton that was assembling in England ready for this massive invasion. When finally the great day came, E-Day arrived, the invasion was about to be launched. British intelligence decided that Garbo would be able to inform his German controllers that the attack had been launched. But it was a question of very, very delicate timing. A wireless message was sent, authorized by General Eisenhower, to the Germans saying some three hours before the troops were going to hit the beaches, that the attack had been launched. It was therefore felt that there would be a sufficient time delay, so therefore there was no way that the attack was going to be prejudiced. That message, crucially sent to the enemy, indicated that an Allied invasion was about to take place in Normandy, but that all the indications were that this uh, landing was a mere diversionary feint. An unexpected bonus turned up when it was transpired that there was nobody in the Abwehr office in Madrid to, to receive Garbo's message. So this was not finally examined and analysed until 8 o'clock in the morning, by which time the British, Canadian and American units were firmly ashore in Normandy.
German response to the landings in Normandy was somewhat surprising. Hitler himself was not disturbed. Uh, he wasn't woken up to be informed of the attack. Rommel, uh, by ill luck, happened to be in Germany uh, at a family celebration. So the response in Normandy was sort of localized and quite muted. Uh, this was in large part because the attack in Normandy was not necessarily perceived as being the main one. And in the uh, days following D-Day, Garbo and his agents sent a stream of intelligence uh, that assured the Germans that the attack was going to come in Calais and that Normandy was little more than a diversion. The Führer had angeordnet that the 15th Army under any circumstances in Normandy will be released. Ja, die Männer der 15. Armee sitzen am Strand fern von Calais und spielen mit Kieselsteinen, während unsere Soldaten in der Normandie abgeschlachtet werden. Die 15. Armee erwartet Patton bei Calais. Und da wird er auch landen, in Calais. Sie bringen es offenbar fertig, diesen Unsinn unwidersprochen hinzunehmen, Jode. Warum? Die Germans maintain their units uh, around Calais, waiting for the second main assault. Uh, the information coming from Garbo and his agents every day confirmed that this was going to happen. Germans had also, in large part thanks to Garbo, had a complete miscalculation of the strength of the Allied units. So as the landings in Normandy grew and were reinforced and reinforced, uh, the Germans believed that was still a sufficiently strong force in southeast England, uh, ready to pounce in Calais. This was arguably Garbo's greatest moment. Uh, he didn't save D-Day on the day. Uh, he did save uh, the Second Front uh, in the days following D-Day. Even when Garbo was challenged, why is it we're now two months after the invasion has taken place in Normandy and still the Allies haven't landed in the Pas de Calais? Garbo's reply was, it seems that the diversionary feint in Normandy was much more successful than anybody expected, so they cancelled the second invasion. And the Germans believed this. One of the contributions that Garbo was able to make uh, towards the uh, post-D-Day intelligence scene was on sending messages back to the Germans about the V-weapon offensive. There was a suggestion that perhaps Garbo would convey information that most of the missiles had overshot London, and so therefore the Germans would reduce the range of the missiles in the hope that they would actually not reach London, that they would fall harmlessly in the fields of Kent. Well. This was a problem that was presented eventually to the War Cabinet because there were members of the War Cabinet who were unhappy about manipulating the enemy to the point where missiles might fall on South London rather than north of the Thames. So it was reported to them that Garbo had been arrested. By a local policeman who had been worried by a foreigner taking such a close interest in the scene. But this was a lesson to the Germans to demonstrate that there were limits 
on what they could ask their master spy. It also enabled the British to be able to take Garbo out of circulation for a period at a very sensitive moment. Now this really marks the beginning of Garbo, the individual's gentle retreat from his privacy. Bit by bit, he moves away, he informs his controllers that he's now resident in Wales, that the heat's too great for him, especially the bombing in London as well. The network continues through his sub-agents. The wireless messages are still being sent, but Garbo's leadership, if you like, starts to diminish. And as Garbo's fortunes start to fade, obviously so do those of Nazi Germany. The messages between Garbo uh, and his controllers in Madrid begins to get rather more plaintive, rather uh, more philosophical, if you like, uh, and rather more sort of introspective you know, about uh, where did it all go wrong and what will become of, uh, of the right. valedictory uh, task that they had for him, which was to go to Spain and make contact with his Abwehr case officers to see and investigate if there was any residual uh, German uh, espionage activity in Spain. So this was Garbo's last mission. He went to Madrid. He found his case officer, who, of course, by now was no longer working at the German embassy and had gone into hiding. And Karl Erich Kulenthal had no clue, no suspicion, that his star agent had been deceiving him for years. He was embarrassed. He said, I'm sorry we've lost the war. I have a large amount of money to give you to thank you for the supreme service that you've given to the Fuhrer. Here is the money, and we will try and stay in touch in case you are needed ever again but I'm sorry the war has worked out so badly, but thank you. Recuerdo que estaba en el baño, era primera hora de la mañana, estaba escuchando la radio, estaba escuchando el programa de, de Luis del Olmo, protagonistas, y, y de repente apareció una entrevista en la que eh, hablaban 
de que había aparecido el espía catalán más famoso de la Segunda Guerra Mundial, doble agente, y que había sido el que había logrado el desembarco de Normandía, y engañando al alto Estado alemán en, en esta operación. Y cuando escuché el nombre completo de la persona que estaban entrevistando, fue cuando sentí como... Sentí algo extraño que, que me hizo rápidamente comentárselo a mi mujer y, y fue cuando los dos de, decimos, pues, pues lo que tenemos que hacer es llamar a tu madre y, y decirle que, que están entrevistando a esta persona y que nos diga si es tu padre o no es tu padre. Y efectivamente fue lo primero que hicimos, llamamos a, a mi madre y mi madre enseguida nos comunicó que efectivamente era nuestro padre de sangre y y yo entonces también se lo comuniqué a mis hermanos, y esta fue de esta forma casual, totalmente casual, eh, os, terminando de afeitarme por la mañana, como, como, como yo supe que había aparecido mi padre. Entonces él tuvo aquí un, un cine, él montó un cine ahí. Por cierto, yo vi algunas películas de esas. Él también era dueño de, de un, un hotel allá abajo y el cine. Le gustaba la playa, caminaba por ahí, le gustaba caminar, trotar eso. Él se ponía sus chores y iba a caminar a trotar. It occurred to me that maybe the story about Garbo dying in Angola really wasn't true. If he was the master deceiver, if he had invented all of these sub-agents that had been supplying him with information during the Second World War, then it was perfectly possible that he might have wanted to cover his tracks and conceal the fact that he had survived the Second World War. So as a first step, I hired a researcher in Barcelona. I recognized the name Pujol as being a Catalan name. Em dic José Antonio Escoriza Martínez, soc professor d'anglès. I asked him to go through the telephone directory in Barcelona as a good starting point. And telephone directories are always the best resource for any intelligence officer. Nigel West eh, va estar buscant el personatge Garbo pensant-se en un principi que es tractava de Felipe Fernández Armesto, que escrivia per La Vanguardia sota el pseudònim d'Augusta Sia. En tota la meva recerca, he trobat dues persones malament. L'any 1984 vaig rebre una trucada telefònica a casa i em vaig tenir molt rebre-la demanant per Joan Pujol García. I em vaig imaginar en aquell moment que l'havien trobat pel distint telefònic perquè el meu pare es deia Joaquim, i que la Joaquim Pujol García comença per jota igual que ell. It turned out that this young man had been Juan Pujol García's nephew. He had an uncle with the same name, and when asked whether his uncle was alive, he revealed that a few years earlier he had received a postcard from his uncle postmarked in Venezuela. I must admit that I was still slightly nervous that I had not got exactly the right person. We were approaching the 40th anniversary of the D-Day landings, and I told Buckingham Palace that Garbo, the extraordinary double agent who had made the D-Day landings possible, was not dead, and that wouldn't it be wonderful if he could come to Buckingham Palace and receive the medal that the British had given him in September 1944. Having obtained that agreement from Buckingham Palace, I was then ready to telephone Juan Pujol García in Caracas. There was a long silence at the other end of the telephone while I pitched my invitation. And Juan Pujol García said, yes, I am Garbo, and I think I would be very interested in visiting Buckingham Palace. 
In a book called Garbo, his code name during the war, Juan Pujol tells for the first time how he became the pivot of the British counterintelligence service. His book tells how he fooled the Germans for more than four years and how his career in espionage culminated in the success of the D-Day Operation Overlord. que una reunión familiar del tema que me reunimos a toda la familia a casa de la meva avia porque para parar el tema porque ninguno sabía re y nos informamos de todo. Everybody seemed to be working on one side or the other. And it seemed to me that everybody was a spy. So I thought, well, this is a business that is sort of the business of Europe. But, well, many of them pretended they were other things. Un home que podia, jo penso que és igual, per fer un simil, que hagués sigut sempre un gran comercial, un gran venedor. Però que hagués pogut vendre mitjons com hagués pogut vendre tractors. He was either incredibly lucky or, or was a, a natural. You think I should invent and take their money? They have no money except what they take in taxes from men like you and me. As long as you invent, you do no harm. And they don't deserve the truth. Ultimately, you have to accept his version, which is uh, this uh, great determination to prevent political extremism from destroying civilization. When we hear opportunism, we think this is a bad thing, but in biology, you need opportunism if you want to survive. So he was, in fact, a champion of survival. 